Rett syndrome is an early onset disorder with a prognosis of living well into adulthood. All of us have a very deep and loving relationship to our loved ones with Rett syndrome. The underpinnings of this relationship are dependent on us having a true understanding of the nature of this diagnosis and acknowledging the real divide we must cross between the love and dreams for our children and the hope of what science predicts to be the realistic promise of treatments and a cure on the horizon. You came to the meeting today to hear the progress, to find hope, and most of all, to hear truth from someone who's been working on this tirelessly. I think you'll like what you're about to hear and that this information will help you feel even more motivated to invest in your children, in the health of yourselves, and our foundation. Dr. Zogby is Professor, Department of Molecular and Human Genetics, Pediatrics, Neurology, and Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. She's the director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Inst Research Institute and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This is just a short list of her accomplishments. Her lab's work help, helped elucidate mechanisms of Rett syndrome almost 20 years ago exactly, and she's been a central figure in another rare disease, spinocerebellar ataxia type 1, as well as another disorder close to our hearts, MECP2 duplication. If you see on this slide, you'll see page one of the original paper published in Nature in 1999 by Dr. Zogby and her team. She's going to talk about this. I have attached this paper as a handout for today's presentation. You're welcome to download that paper and print it out. I think it's important to understand where we've come and where we're going. Dr. Zogby is a longtime member and leader in our Rett syndrome community who never loses sight of our children in her pursuit of her scientific discovery. If you are ready, Dr. Zogby, I am going to go ahead and turn the screen over to you so that you may begin your presentation. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you, uh, Paige, for allowing me the opportunity to share some of our progress with the families and the research community of Red Syndrome. I would like to welcome all of you, and I hope that in today's presentation, you'll get an overview of what has happened since my first encounter with Red Syndrome. And I also hope that many of the questions that some of you submitted, you will feel answered during the presentation, but at the end, we were left ample time. If something was not covered, I'll be happy to share with you. So with that, I'm going to uh, close my, uh, share my screen right now and go into the presentation mode. All right, can- Wonderful, we, we can see your slides, yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, I think everyone knows that my journey with Rett syndrome started with meeting Ashley back in 1983. And I always like to show her picture, although now she's a beautiful grown lady, because really this was the inspiration for me, seeing her and seeing other girls like her to really try to pursue the cause of this disorder. And uh, just walking down memory lane, if you will, back then I had fantastic clinical mentors. You will recognize many of the names, Dr. Alan Percy, Daniel Gray's, and uh, Dr. Ian Butler, who helped us study biogenic amine metabolites in the spinal fluid and Rett syndrome, and Dr. Vince Riccardi, who was the geneticist at the time when we saw Ashley. So since that time, uh, and seeing those handful of patients reported in this paper, I was really convinced that this has to be a disorder caused by a gene just because of all the features, which I think all of you are familiar with, that are consistently seen in Rett syndrome. And back then, the genome wasn't sequenced, and it was a little bit of a challenge. So it took us a little bit of a while, almost 16 years from seeing Ashley, but we were fortunate that, thanks to the work of a persistent postdoc, Ruthi Amir, we were able to find uh, that RET is caused by mutation on, in a gene on the X chromosome called methyl CPG binding protein 2 or MECP2 or MECP2. And 
what methyl CPG uh, binding means is what uh, Dr. Berg has elucidated in the early 90s that this protein bind a, uh, a nucleic acid cytosine that is a base pair cytosine that's when methylated can be bound by this protein. And typically what this binding does in the DNA, it can probably affect the expression of other genes and changes how a cell responds with gene expression. And this is what we believe this protein is doing at the molecular level exactly. What are the immediate direct target of this gene and what are the indirect changes still being elucidated, but at least we know that this is a protein that's important, that bind methylated DNA, and that somehow can regulate the expression uh, of genes. So what I'd like to cover with you today is what we learned uh, from studies in our lab uh, during the past 20 years and others during the past 20 years. So I will cover four broad areas. First, we'll review a little bit what we've learned in the discovery of the gene about the clinical disorders that could be caused by mutations in this gene. We'll also share with you some of the studies we've learned about the effect of this protein and its importance for neuronal function. I will share with you uh, the importance of the level of MACP2 for normal neurological function. And I will explore with you some of the therapeutic interventions we are pursuing. And at the end, we will probably open it up for discussion and we can go broader from what I have covered here. So as you know, typical features of classic Rett syndrome is regression and the inability to really learn new things after a certain uh, age. You know, these girls might learn some words or might learn some things early on, but somehow after their second birthday, we see regression and the inability to learn as efficiently. They have stereotyped head movement. And early on, they may have features maybe of being withdrawn, uh, which are, that's why Hagbert called it an autism uh, disorders. But I think later on, we all know they have much better eye contact and they really can recognize family and can be more social. And they have problems with motor function. They cannot, they have difficulty motor with motor planning and initiating movements and tremors are quite common. And then of course, autonomic dysfunction, seizures. And in the older patients, we see some rigidity and dystonia and features of Parkinsonism. So this is when you have a mutation in the gene in a female, one will get Rett syndrome. And this is because it's on the X chromosomes and there are two X chromosomes in every female, one healthy and one carrying the Rett genes. So therefore, if you were to imagine every cell in the brain, half of the cells will be normal with normal levels of MACP2, but the other half may be missing that functional uh, MACP2. So the brain is a mosaic, if you will, and that's when you end up with Rett syndrome. What we learned since then, because we didn't know at the time, we suspected there may be some males who might die early, but we know now that there are indeed a few very rare males with uh, mutations in this gene. In the case of the male, because males have a single X chromosomes, all the cells lack a normal copy of the gene. And these boys unfortunately have symptoms early on. Encephalopathy means they're not exactly alert or able to support breathing on their own and they uh, have many motor problems, seizures. And sadly, these males die typically in, the, in infancy when they lack the gene completely in every cell. But as more and more people were studied with mutations in this gene, we're beginning to identify people that have what we call milder mutations. Hypomorphic means milder mutations. So you can see here, the fainter levels of the MACP2 protein. Maybe it's not as high as it in a normal healthy cell. Maybe it's not functioning as well, but at least it has some function remaining. And these individuals, Typically, many of them could be males and sometimes females. They may have mild learning disability. They may have features of autism. They may have anxiety or OCD, 
hyperactivity and tremors. Some few, a handful, have been described with bipolar disorders, and even a handful of cases have been described with juvenile onset schizophrenia as well as intellectual disability. Typically, everybody will have mild learning disability. I would also say tremors are common, but these features are in different colors because they're not in every patient. So one patient may have autism, another might have anxiety, another might have bipolar, and so on. So then, as you will see here, from the time of the discovery of this gene as a cause of Rett syndrome, now we know there is a lot of other disorders that may present slightly differently than Rett that are due to different types of mutations in this gene, some milder, of course, and some uh, more severe. And uh, after the discovery of the genes, our lab and many other labs have created mouse model uh, for uh, Rett syndrome. And I think what's important to note is that we're fortunate in this case that you can model Rett syndrome in mice. And I'm going to show you here a video of one of the models where you see a healthy mouse and uh, trying to resist being handled. And you can see the red mouse model with this four paw activity that mimics the stereotypies. And then you'll see a tremor at the end when the mouse is held still. So it is fortunate that we have that because if you have a good mouse model, you can do a lot of studies to understand the disease. You can test therapeutic intervention. You can learn so much about these disorders. And as I mentioned, many others have created their uh, dozens and dozens of mouse models that uh, people have created and uh, tested, and uh, we're very grateful for that. One thing we learned after the discovery of the Rett syndrome gene is that doubling this protein can also cause a progressive neurological disorders. In our lab, we've learned this first in mice, um, whereby we discovered that having adding the human gene in mice, now you have two copies, one from the mouse and one from the human, resulted in a progressive neurological disorders. And around the same time, shortly after, many individuals were diagnosed where they had an extra copy uh, of the gene. And these duplications are large, but uh, MECP2 is the one gene that's always in common in that duplicated region, and, and there's always another gene right next to it, IRAC1. But we do think, because of the features that we see in the mice, which include autism, anxiety, um, inability to learn, uh, behavioral issues, motor dysfunction, abnormal uh, breathing, respiratory problems, all of these features, many of them. We don't see respiratory infections in the mice, but we see that if you challenge them, their immune system is not very normal. But we see almost all of the other features, including the epilepsy, the stereotype movement, and the premature death uh, in these mice. When we put them on a particular genetic marker, by one year, most of the mice are dead, whereas the children typically in the second or third decade so we know then most likely most of these features are caused by having this extra copy of the protein. And from that, we learned that actually the dose of this protein is very critical. So as I mentioned to you, a male may not have any healthy copy. A male with a mutation will be extremely severe. A female that will have one normal copy and half of her cells and lack the other half will give us Rett syndrome. We have to have just the right level. If you have twice the normal level, I mentioned to you these children, unfortunately, will have a progressive disease and, and that goes to premature death in majority. But we also know if you have three times the level, both in mice and in humans, the disease is even more severe. So the dosage is, of this protein is really important. And ideally, you want to stay in this range. You want to come as close to the normal, the 100% normal as possible. And what we also learned is that this protein is really important for the function of neurons. If it's totally lacking, as in the males, these green dots here are synapses. So you'll see a healthy neuron with very nice synapses. You'll see there are fewer synapses 
an email that totally, this is from a mouse model, attack this gene. And you'll see here that if you have the duplication, you have too many synapses. So what's important to note is we one will need to have the right number of synapses for normal neurological function. Too little, as in the case of RET, is bad, and too much, as in the case of the duplication, is also bad. I mentioned to you at the beginning, we believe this protein is important to regulate the expression of genes. And what you'll see here is a lot of genes that are altered in the mice lacking the gene. And you'll see many genes go down, some genes go up. But if you look in the duplication model, you'll see the opposite. So almost most of the things we see go the opposite way. You'll see decreased synapses in one, in this one, and you'll see increased synapses here. You'll see the genes that go down here might go up here and vice versa. And, you'll, and these are a lot of genes that are altered. Many of them are altered by just a small amount, 10, maybe 20%. And some of them are altered by 50%. And one of the questions we had, do we know what genes are downstream of MACP2? There are many, but in this slide, what I'm showing you is just a sampling of genes that we know are altered in the MACP2 mouse models. And each of this gene is altered by say 20% or 50% in the RET models. But you will see that on its own, this gene is mutated in either autism or intellectual disability, and this one, and this one, and so on and so forth. The point is many of these genes that are downstream of MACP2, and they may be misregulated in MACP2, they on their own can cause a neurological or syndromic autism and intellectual disability. So this tells us how important this protein is, how many genes that are important for neurological function are regulated. And it's going to be really hard to just say there is one gene that's altered, let's go and correct that. What we really need to go is go after MACP2 itself. We need to really think of ways to make it functional or to replace it for a treatment. It's going to be very hard to treat downstream gene by gene. One thing we know that there are a lot of neurological abnormalities seen in people with Rett syndrome. And we've done studies to look at, you know, which neurons these abnormalities are coming from. Could the movement motor rigidity be coming from the dopamine neuron? Could balance be coming from another type of neuron? So what we've done, we've done studies where we eliminated the gene from a particular type of neuron to understand what happens. And what we learned from these studies is that this protein is important for the function of all the neurons we assessed. And particularly, I'm gonna share with you something we learned, summarize data we learned from the work of multiple people in the lab. Uh, their names are shown at this slide where in the brain, there are two types, major types of neurons, the excitatory neurons and the inhibitory neurons. The excitatory neurons sort of what make the cells go. Uh, it's the signal for things, for information to move and the cells to be active. The inhibitory neurons, and those, the excitatory make about 80% of the cells, the inhibitory neurons maybe about 20% of the cells. The inhibitory neurons regulate that flow of information from the excited neurons. So although they're only 20%, they're really quite important. And what you see here, when we eliminate the gene from the excitatory neurons, we get things like anxiety, we get the tremor, uh, we get the feeding behavior. Red animals seem to eat uncontrollably, if you will, when they're still healthy and able to reach the food, so they get obese. They also have problems with coordination. And in the males, either loss in the excitatory neurons or the inhibitory neurons in the males causes lethality. For the inhibitory neurons, we learned that these are really important for seizures, spasticity, the motor planning, repetitive behavior, learning and memory, and social deficit. So it's quite interesting that 
the loss of this, what we learn is you, lo you lose this protein in the brain. What happens is the neurons depend on it and its loss will partially disable these neurons. If a neuron normally functions at say 100% capacity, taking away this gene makes it function at 70% capacity. It re reduces its ability to function somewhere in the 30 or 40% range. And this shows you what happens when you partially disable inhibitory neurons or partially disable excitatory neurons. Some things really depend on both systems like motor function and survival, breathing, but some things are more noticeable when you disable one or the other. And even within the inhibitory neurons, the different subtypes of neurons, we were able to even parse out the features to learn what neurons, the somatostatin neurons, are most vulnerable to drive maybe seizures and others to drive social behavior. So this really, these studies not only helped us learn that this protein is important for the function of all neurons, we, we, all, we also learned that you need to bring it back to all neurons because you, you want to keep the balance and the functionality in all of these neurons. You can't just come and bring it back to one type or the other. It's really important for all of them. Since that work, looking at what function in particular neurons, we've decided to begin to study the brain network. What happens in the brain of a red mouse? So in this case, now we're looking at the female mice that lack a functional copy in, in when, uh, on one of their genes and have one function, functional copy. So they're exactly like a female with red syndrome where one copy is lacking. And what we wanted to know, how does the brain activity behave during uh, trying to learn a task. And I'm gonna show you here what we do. What we do is we can put a virus that expresses a fluorescent calcium sensitive protein that will fluoresce every time the neuron fires. And there's a small microscope that will allow us to watch these neurons in real time and see every time they're firing and try to learn something about how the brain network is in Rett sy syndrome compared to, say, a healthy mouse. And you'll see now when I play the video that the mouse is fine. It has the microscope on top of its head, and it's moving around perfectly fine. You'll see here that there are blood vessels, and you see some neuron firing. These are the raw data. We can then take away the background and just focus on the neurons firing. And you can watch the neuron firing either at rest when the animal just in the cage, or you can watch the firing pattern when the animal is trying to learn a task. And here is an example how when each cell fires, you see this little peak here, you can see these little peaks on the screen. So what did we learn from that? One thing we learned that really surprised us, and this is a work of Lin Ji, he, a postdoc in the lab, is that in Rett syndrome, unlike the control animals, there are more tendency for neurons to fire together in a synchronized way. So if you take, for example, any time you look at a, a healthy mouse, you'll see this neuron is firing now, this neuron doesn't fire at the same time, but fires now, this one fires here. So every one of these colors is a neuron firing. And what you see in the red that often you can capture multiple neurons firing at the same time. You see that here, you see two neurons firing here, you see that here, and so on. And we can quantify that, whether it is when we're training the animal or we're trying to teach them uh, a behavioral task, every time we find that the red brain has more neuron firing synchronously together. And we believe this a uh, feature is perhaps something that may be interfering with the learning and memory that we hope that these animals will do better, but at this point we know that they have a deficit. And we're digging deeper now to really understand exactly what's driving this increased, it's called synchrony, whereby neurons fire together. This is one of the areas our research is focused on now to understand what's driving it and what can we do about it. 
one thing we explored to see if we can do something about this is stimulating the circuit. And particularly, we wanted to try a part of the brain that's important for learning and memory. That's the same part I showed you this abnormal synchrony from. And uh, we wanted to evaluate what would happen if we manipulated the network activity. And for this, we used a technique called deep brain stimulation, or DBS for short. Many of you have heard about this because it's used in Parkinson's disease. And there are many thousands of people have been implanted for movement disorders, for tremors, for epilepsy. There are even some testing in Alzheimer. But we were really interested to see if it's going to help with the learning and memory. And this is work was done with, uh, by our colleague, John Rong Tang, particularly Shuang Hao in his lab performed the experiments I'm sharing with you, where she stimulated a part of the brain that projects to the hippocampus where the learning and memory happens. So she stimulates in this area, and we record in this area to know because these fibers, this bundle projects into the hippocampus. So this way we know that the stimulation is happening and we also we know we're doing no harm. We're not causing any seizures or any abnormal neuronal activity. So what happens when we did the stimulation? We did this in uh, two months old red animals and we uh, activated the stimulation for one hour every day for two weeks. We used parameters that neurosurgeons typically use in the clinic for other uh, disorder for this is moved. And then we evaluated the ability of the mice to learn. We evaluated the plasticity of the brain because we knew the plasticity was reduced. And we also look at the birth of new neurons uh, in these animals. And I will just summarize here that what we've learned is that the DBS did enable the animals to learn again and improved plasticity, actually normalized plasticity and improved neurogenesis. You all heard about new neurogenesis in the past. That's the ability to form new neurons. And there are few places in the brain when new, newly born neurons are born and integrated in the network. And the hippocampus is one of those areas. So here is a healthy animal. You see a healthy amount of newly born neurons, as you can see here. Sorry. In the red animals, we found much fewer newly born neurons. You can see they're very sparse, very few, unlike in the healthy wild type animals. Some of them are red because they're already differentiating to integrate in the network. Some of them are green because they're just, just born. But in the red mouse model, we see much fewer of such neurons. But after deep brain stimulation, we saw much uh, higher number of newly born neurons, both in the healthy animals and in the red animals. So this may be in part contributing to the ability of these mice to learn better. Now, you remember the synchrony I told you uh, about that's increase in red syndrome. So here, what we learned is that the deep brain stimulation corrected that abnormal synchrony where too many neurons fire together compared to the healthy animals. These are healthy animals without DBS, healthy animals with DBS, and they have reduced you know, normal level of synchrony or firing together, but here the red animals have a lot more, but after the DBS, that helps. We wanted to understand what could be what could DBS be doing to gene expression? Because we knew that many genes were altered. I, I showed you the graphs where hundreds to thousands of genes were altered when you lose the protein. And what we found that after deep brain stimulation, about a quarter of, of the genes from those that were altered at the age we tested, there were about 156 altered, 25% of those correct corrected, were normalized. And many of those were we knew were important uh, to for neuronal function and synapsic fun function. So we went back to the female red. This was in the loss of function model, total male nulls. We went back to the red mice and we asked if we will 
do the same DBS paradigm that we did, that we knew three weeks later when we tested the animals, improved their learning and memory, memory, what will happen to the gene expression data? And what you'll see here for many of the genes that we know were altered in red, you'll see here the healthy animals. You see many of the genes are altered in the heterozygous red mice. Uh, after DBS, you see them in the healthy animal normal, but after DBS now in the red mice, you see them also reaching very similar pattern and levels to the wild type animal. This is work of uh, Amy Buhodish and Hari Helamanchali, uh, Yelamanchali in uh, our lab at the Lou lab. So at least this told us that this deep brain stimulation is not only correcting behavior, but it's also correcting the molecules that may be driving that abnormal behavior. So if we were to summarize then what we learned from these studies is that this improved hippocampal learning and memory, plasticity, uh, restored the synchrony pattern that we were seeing in the hippocampus, increased neurogenesis, improved gene expression changes. And what this tells us is that the red brain, at least in mice, is responsive to neuromodulation through this deep brain stimulation. I should mention this type of deep brain stimulation in the fornix has been tested in humans with Alzheimer to determine if it can improve uh, memory in them. Of course, in Alzheimer is different because the neurons there are lost, but in red, the neurons are still there. So this gives us hope that perhaps this could be useful. We also discovered something very interesting because I, uh, there are other mouse models of syndromic autism and intellectual disability that have had gene expression studies. We found that many of the genes altered in some of these other models also typically were activated after deep brain stimulation. So it suggests that this could be helpful for other syndromes as well. So what we learned then from these studies is that it corrects, it results in many gene expression changes and it promotes things that are altered in Rett syndrome and some genes that are important for pro-survival of newly born neurons. And maybe that's why we see improved neurogenesis. And it does normalize gene critical for synaptic function. And we believe it's a good way to improve hippocampal function. So what we're doing now, we're continuing to test. We're, we're now going to test a new model for this to really see if we can continue. Uh, we know that DBS lasts several weeks. So if you give them two weeks of DBS, we knew, knew it lasts for up to six weeks. But we know after six weeks, the effects wear it down. So we're going to see how often it has to be given and how long it would remain effective. We are also beginning to look at other brain regions, uh, working with uh, Dr. Tang's lab. We're looking now at areas of the brain that affect motor function, and we're beginning to see some promising results, but that's still ongoing. We wanted to also see if it will work in other models of intellectual disability. So Dr. Tang tried this in the CDKL5 uh, mice, and he also showed uh, found really nice uh, recovery and improvement of the learning and memory. So these are the things that are ongoing. But you think a little bit about what DBS might be doing to neurons, it's really massively pushing the neurons into uh, the, the activity of the neurons in a direction to do what they can do best. So this finding inspired us to look whether while we're optimizing all the studies for DBS, whether intensive training in the RET models could actually be a potential measure we can take for maybe improving some phenotypes or to use it in addition to any other treatment that may be developed. So a graduate student in my lab, Nate Akili, decided to determine if intensive early training could improve both motor and memory defects in Rett syndrome. And the test we were going to, I'm going to share with you today that he's done in the intensive training, one is for motor coordination where we put the mice on this rotating rod and ask how long does it take them to fall? We know that red mice don't do well on this task, they fall quickly. 
and we want to see if intensive training will help them with this task. And the other one is the memory test, one of the memory tests we tested after DBS, where the mice has to learn how to swim to find a target and remember where the target is. So first I'm going to tell you the paradigm we did. This, uh, let me just see if I can minimize. Well, it, it's hard to see here, but I, I, what I want to tell you, there were three groups of mice. Red mice that were just handled regularly on a weekly basis, just like the mice that being trained, just to make sure it's not the handling, and then they will get tested. Then we took mice that we let them age till six months, and we do all the intensive training shortly before we test them at that six months. And then another group of mice where we start the training at two months and we train them and we test them again at six months. So basically we're comparing the effect of late training to early training to no training. Just test the red mice, just let them be six months old and see what's the natural course of red syndrome see if you can modify the course of red syndrome by intensive training before testing, or see if you can modify it by doing early and repetitive training over a spread period of time. And here are the results. What we found that pre-symptomatic training improved motor function. So here's healthy animals. They can stay 200 seconds on the rod without falling. Here's a red mice that haven't been trained, just natural course of the disease at six months, you see them quite weak and falling. Here's you see the animals that were trained intensely just before the test. They did better than no training at all, that's for sure. But actually the mice that were trained early at six months, they're doing remarkably better than those that were not trained. So this to me was really, really interesting and exciting in that it told us that for any particular, in this particular test, that early training really changed the course of the disease. That means there is some plasticity of these neurons, but somehow it requires a lot more intense work to see an outcome and this is why the deep brain stimulation, which was really intense, gave us an outcome. Now, the same animals that were trained on this task were tested on other tasks. They don't, they don't see a benefit. We don't see a benefit there. So it's really task specific. So the next task we wanted to do is now for the hippocampus, which is learning and memory. I mentioned to you, uh, this is a test for spatial memory the mouse has to remember. This is a pool and there is a hidden platform. The mouse doesn't usually like being in the water, so it tries to swim, swim to find the platform. And you could see, if I can play this again, on, uh, on you, the first day they take a long time to get to the platform, but the, by the fourth day they learn because they use spatial cues and now a healthy mouse will quickly get to the platform. And once they've learned that, we want to see if they can remember. So we take away the platform and we put them back in the pool. And again, a healthy mouse would remember the platform was here and will spend all of the time searching this platform and particularly crossing the area of the platform. Typically, we knew from many other studies we've done, a healthy mouse will learn that and will do it quickly. But unfortunately, the red mice don't do that. They they can't remember where the platform is and they keep searching till they find it. We knew that deep brain stimulation can help this, so we now asked with intensive training also help. So here we started training the mice at one month. We didn't want to wait as late as we waited for the motor uh, uh, test because we didn't want to start at a time where the mice don't like to swim, the red mice after a certain age don't like to swim. And again, we handle them, no training, just handling and then testing, then late training and testing, and then repetitive training on a monthly basis, and then finally testing multiple times uh, a, a week on a monthly basis. So here's what we learned. If you take a red mouse that has never been trained, 
they will not find the platform. They will continue searching randomly, searching and searching. If you take a mouse with red that has been trained late, they have the same problem. Again, that really doesn't help them. If you take a, a wild type mouse, you put it for the first time in the pool. At the beginning, it doesn't know where it is. As I showed you with the graph, it will take time and then it will learn. But if you take a healthy mouse with late training or early training, it will quickly find the platform. And if you took a red mouse with early training, you see here, it does remarkably better and it does find the platform quite early. So this told us that, again, this pre-symptomatic intensive training in, the, in this particular task is helpful. Now we ask, what happens if we took away the platform with the red mice search the right space? And what you'll see here is that healthy mice, of course, will spend most of the time in the, in the right space, but not the red animals. They are searching all the quadrants randomly, as you'll see here. This is all random, but this is the target platform. And again, the late training doesn't help. But the red mice that have been trained early, they are now doing very similarly to the uh, healthy controls. And you'll see here again, this is the naive, untrained, late training, and then uh, early training. And with early training, of course, the healthy animals do better, but the, with early training, the red animals do almost as good as healthy animals, uh, naive. So this was really quite exciting. And I think this is important because it tells us that focus tra training on particular ca uh, task can actually help people with red syndrome. And it tells us that everything you're doing, I know the parents do a lot of physical therapy and a lot of behavioral therapy and a lot of occupational therapy. And you might wonder, is it really making a difference? And I believe it is. But I think the, the, the data also tells us the earlier we do this, the better. Somebody said, can I do something for my one year old? And I would say, as much as you can train them on motor function or any functions that's really time gained, it might at least delay the course of their disease till we have better and effective therapeutics that will tackle the disease in a very serious and definitive way. It also makes us really emphasize the importance of early diagnosis and early intervention and the fact that anything you do now no matter what therapy will come down the line, whether it's gene therapy, whether it's therapy to correct the, the deficit, whatever the therapy is, the combination with this kind of training would be helpful. So focused intensive training, especially if early, we found to be beneficial in red mouse model. And since the red mouse model really has been very true to the disease, I would be hopeful that this would be also true for the disease. Now, many of you asked us about Henry. They want to know why we study Henry Engel and what does his mutation teach us? And, uh, you know, Henry presented with global developmental delay and motor import, uh, impairments. He has a mutation uh, that has never been seen before, neither in people with red nor in healthy individual. We suspected that this mutation is the cause of Henry's symptoms, but we could not be sure because it was never seen before. We suspected that based on where it's located within the protein. We predicted it can disrupt the function of the protein. So the only way to really be sure is to create this mutation in the mouse. So we created a mouse that has the exact same mutation. And this way one can be sure this is the cause of disease. We knew this mutation does not affect the RNA, which means you make RNA from DNA, and you can see here both in the mouse, all of these are normal. But what we did learn is that this mutation affects the level of MACP2. So this is a healthy animal here, and you can see the amount of MACP2. These are controlled to tell you we have equal amount of protein uh, in these gels. And you'll see here the amount of MACP2, but with Henry's mutation, you'll see less protein. It's decreased. And 
we've tested these mice on variety of behavior. Here you can see them on the rotating rod. You'll see that they cannot stay as long. This is the test I showed you for which we've done intensive training and seen improvement. We also tested neurons from Henry's fibroblasts to see if that's also true. And here again, we found that the MACP2 protein in Henry's neurons is decreased compared to these two control samples. We've edited Henry's mutations, so we know that the controls are matched. So when we correct the mutation, we see that it's decreased. So why is this important? Henry is, I mentioned to you, is uh, the reason we, we like to study this model is because we know two things. We know Henry, although he's a boy, he doesn't have the typical severe rat-like or encephalopathy type of syndrome um, that the typical males have. And the reason is, is because he has a functional protein. But that functional protein doesn't, we don't have enough of it. You can see how it is reduced. And you can see here in the mice how it is reduced. So it's reduced from the normal level. And that, but it's still there. And that explains why he is milder. And the fact that it is reduced and the fact that his mouse model has many of the features that we see in the red syndrome animals, we believe if we can do something to increase the level of Henry's protein from here to here, we might improve his symptoms. And this is something we might apply to other mutations in red syndrome that also either decrease the level of the protein or the function. I should mention all of this work on Henry's mice and Henry's cell is done by a graduate student in Yao so what we're doing right now is we're looking for genes that can regulate protein levels. We believe in our genome, there are going to be genes that increase MACP2, and there are going to be genes that decrease MACP2. And we know that in people with the duplication, there's too much MACP2, so we're going to bring it down to normal. We know in people like Henry and maybe some of the red syndrome and mutations where the protein levels the mutation still makes a protein, but the protein is not as functional or not as high. We want to find ways to increase that. And our idea if, is if we can identify something that normally decreases MACP2, we can perhaps come up with a pill that inhibits it, and that will allow us to increase MACP2 and vice versa for the duplication. So we're in the midst of these screens. We've identified such molecules. And we're trying to see any of them are druggable. Can any of them be used in the future to modulate the protein level? So that's one strategy we're taking. The other strategy we're taking is applies for the duplication. And in this case, as you know, in the duplication, there is an extra copy of the gene. And we wanted to ask if we normalize the level of this gene in adult symptomatic animals, can we rescue them? We did this first genetically, where we deleted the copy of the extra gene in adult, and we found that we rescued all the features. The next thing was to do this with uh, a therapeutic. Antisense oligonucleotides are small therapeutics, and this work we collaborated with Ionis Pharmaceuticals, and this is the work of Hezi and Yin Yao again. And what are ASOs? They're small pieces of DNA that can bind to an RNA. And when you make this duplex, an enzyme will come and degrade it, and you will not make the extra protein. So we used our mouse model that had an extra copy from the human gene. This is a healthy mouse, and this is the duplication. The duplication has one mouse copy and one human copy. We used an ASO to the human copy. And what you see here is the mice improved. Here's one example where you see a healthy mouse, very active. You see the duplication mice, less active, right here. And you see after the antisense, their activity improves. And also they can stand on their hind legs. They get into the center more. So all their activity improved. And that was exciting. We've done many behaviors that they improved on. But we wanted to ask, what if we wait later? What if we let the 
animals get older to the, where they are six to eight months old. And at that time, the duplication mice are having seizures all, almost every day, all day long. And so what if we wait till they're that old and we give them the antisense oligo treatment for four weeks, what will happen? And what we found that the mice that were having seizures all the time after the antisense oligo treatment where we normalized MECP2, the EEG normalized and their seizures, their clinical seizures stopped. This to me is a really, really exciting result because it tells us that even if we waited later in the life of the mouse, where the disease has really set in and the mice are quite sick, this can be reversed. Now, many of you know that Adrian Bird and Stuart Cobb and Rudy Yenish, all of them have done experiment where they brought back MACP2 genetically uh, or used a gene therapy approach, also Gail Mendel in red mice and corrected symptoms. So the big question is, many of you send me the question is, is this going to work? What does reversing something in mice mean? Is this going to work in a human? And at this point, we can be hopeful. I can say from both the studies in Brett syndrome, uh, by all the investigators as mentioned, as well as the work in the duplication syndrome in our hands, we believe that there is hope that we can reverse at least some of the key symptoms. You know, it may be hard to treat a 20 year old and expect them to be able to immediately, you know, learn how to walk and talk. But if they're having seizures all the time, that may help. And that will have a huge impact on their ability then to learn. If they're having breathing difficulty, I imagine that could be help. So I am hopeful that really these interventions will at least treat some of the symptoms right away. And maybe with time, with additional interventions, they can also help the individual be receptive to learn new things. So um, with these results, we now did additional work for the duplication to go into, um, to be, to prepare for going into human trials. Uh, as you know, in human, there are two human genes and you have to be sure that we go from double to normal. We cannot go too low. And this is something we've done by creating a new mouse that has two human genes, no, no mouse genes anymore. And now we use an ASO that will hit both of them as might happen in a human with the hope that we can titrate this dose. And we've been able to show that you can titrate the ASO just like you would titrate any drug so this high dose was too high because it's lower than normal, but this dose is just right, and this dose is not low enough, so it's not normalizing it well enough. But what we've shown in, in these now humanized mice, again, their learning and memory problem with the proper dose will get back to the normal baseline level. The, the duplication animals turn to freeze more, if you will, uh, and with the low dose, they didn't benefit as much, but with the right dose, they benefited here. So we're continuing to work with IONIS for this clinical readiness right now, and we're quite excited about moving this forward. This to show you here that these duplication animals stay longer. It's Remember, I told you many things they do is the opposite of Rett syndrome. They stay longer on the rotating rod, but again, after this treatment, they it normalizes and they get close to normal. And here I'd like to pause and just make a tribute to Brody Moo, who many of you know, Ashley was my first threat syndrome patient. Well, Brody was my first duplication patient and I was really very attached to him. And after meeting him, inspired to work on this syndrome. Unfortunately, Brody passed away May 25th. He was, you know, very sick and sadly would not be one of those who benefit from what we're working on, but one way to honor his legacy is to, and, and to help all the other children I have ever met since then is to continue pushing this work, work forward and that we will do. So in summary, if we pull all this together, uh, mutations in this gene, as you know, cause Rett syndrome and as I shared with you now, a variety of other 
neurological disorders and psychiatric features, partial, partial phenotypes, if you will, of red. Um, I, I think now we all know how critical this protein is for the function of many, if not all, brain cells. Uh, Gail Maldell has shown it's important for astrocytes and others as well. Uh, we've shown it's important for many of the neurons we studied. The brain is very sensitive to changes in the protein level, so any therapy we do, we have to be mindful that we treat so that we, if it's if the level is too low, we bring it up just enough to cause a rescue and maybe not too much enough so that affecting the healthy cells, whether that being gene therapy or any of the strategies we're following. Neuromodulation using DBS, at least in the animal model, has proven really, really helpful. And we will continue to press on with that because maybe some features that maybe uh, might benefit from that eventually in the patients. And I shared with you today something that's really helpful. One, to reassure those of you who are already doing so, and others to really inspire those who have young children that the intensive training may be helpful in delaying symptom onset or improving functionality. And uh, we're pushing forward with the ASO therapy together with IONIS, as it's promising for MDS and MACP2 duplication syndrome, and we hope we will uh, continue with the clinical readiness to move this forward uh, in the near future. And we're screening for other modulators, and this is where the work with Henry's mutation and mice is helping us to do these analyses. And with that, I just want to thank uh, all the people who contributed to the work I presented to you today. Samir contributed uh, to some of the work. I didn't mention his name, and Rupa is doing the screens, and so is Manar. But these, I mentioned everybody else as we went through the slides and our collaborators and computational colleagues. And heartfelt thanks to all of you who really worked with us um, patiently from the time we saw the patients and wanted to study them to discover the gene and patiently awaiting help in any shape or form. I, I, I cannot describe how much I appreciate what you go through, and I want to let you know that our team is really dedicated. We are hopeful there will be therapies for RET that will be disease-modifying, and I hope that this will continue. We're holding a meeting here next month uh, at the NRI for researchers from all over the world who work in this syndrome and outside the syndrome to give us advice so that uh, together we can really think uh, how we can keep pushing forward to develop therapeutics. Um, you know, the foundations, uh, RSO and RSRT, felt it's the 20th anniversary of the gene discovery, and this may be a time for celebration, and I felt it's really time to roll our sleeve and work harder together so that at the 25th anniversary, we're celebrating victory with a good therapeutic for both Red syndrome and MACP2 duplication. That would be the true celebration. And I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zogby. That's a, a lot of information and really encouraging information. Um, I'm going to ask you to leave your slides up so that if you want to refer back um, to any point that someone's asking for clarification on, you'll have the ability to do so. Sure. Okay. I think many of the questions that were asked uh, were answered by you in your presentation. I sent them to you. Uh, the ones that were pre-submitted at registration. If you could take a moment and scan through those, let's start with, um, with those questions. And the first one is really, what are the main downstream genes impacted from MECP2 dysfunction? So as I mentioned, many genes are important for synaptic function and neuronal function. And many we know many of these genes are important because as you saw, some of them, when mutated, when only one copy is missing and the other copy is still normal, they cause syndromic autism or intellectual disability. So there are many genes important for neurological function. 
and there are many of them. Yeah. Okay. And we talked a lot about Cure and your thoughts about Cure. We appreciate your optimism and uh, we know that it comes from the real work and results you're seeing in your lab. Um, there is a question that did come in which said, how can people with Rett syndrome improve when their heads are smaller in diameter and a normal head has larger diameter? So can you speak to the, the we know that not all children with Rett syndrome suffer small head circumference, but right. that is one of the diagnostic features. Is this something that you can speak to? Sure, the, the reason the head size is small is because the size of the neurons and their branches, you remember I showed that slide about synapse number being decreased mm -hmm. and, and with the decreased synapse number, decreased activity, decreased uh, functionality of the neuron, the neurons are smaller. Uh, this is what really accounts for the uh, size of the head. And uh, early on, you know, it's possible perhaps, it's hard to change the size of the head, you know, because the skull becomes a limiting factor, obviously. But you can improve the functionality of the existing neurons, perhaps through training combined with whatever new therapies will come on board. I think some of that will improve. Whether, you know, depending on the age when the therapy is started, whether the head size could be changed, I think that remains to be seen if it's happening at a later stage because the limitation will become the skull. But I imagine there's still some space between the brain and the skull in these girls, so there's room for growth and improvement, hopefully, with interventions. Yeah, we hope so too. Okay, um, we have a comment from a parent who is talking about her daughter who's 35 years old and parent is saying that it seems that as she's getting older, the more she seems to understand and respond to the world around her. Is this norm in RET? And I'll have to say this is something that I hear often from parents of our older patients as well. Yes, I actually think that's uh that's probably something we see in, in many children with it. As, a, as you recall, I mentioned that early on as they're going through the regression, they become withdrawn and social behavior is decreased. And, you know, Hagberg, Professor Hagberg, who was really a world expert on Red syndrome, called it autism in his first paper because he saw them at a particular age group. But if you would see them at a later age group, they're really beginning with probably that repetitive social interactions that the parents show them and the families and the people who work with them, you start seeing eye contact. They learn how to point with their eyes to indicate their likes or dislikes. So I think I, I can imagine that as that continues and that interaction and whatever activities uh, the individual is being engaged in, it's not surprising to me that there will be some improvement. And that's encouraging. And that's, again, I think, speak to this intensive training being helpful. Mm -hmm. So connecting the data that you showed that intensive training was not quite as effective in mice in later stage, mm -hmm. and yet in humans, we are seeing perhaps a, a reawakening or higher receptivity, perhaps, to intensive training. Do you, do you suspect that? So I think that? You have to remember, we don't really know how to translate age, a six months old mouse. You know, mice live two years, right? Mm -hmm. Many of the girls by one or two years are, are doing fine and there's a lot of opportunity to train them. It's hard to translate some of these things and we don't know when does if the window of intensive training changes in human with time, how how much more receptive are humans than mice? I mean, mice, there are only so much you can do with them, right? So I think these are all issues that are important to keep in mind. Um, just because we don't see as 
much of it. We, we did see some benefit with the later training on a couple of tasks, but just because we don't see it as good as early, that doesn't mean I would not do it anymore later on. I, I just think it's something that we should keep in mind and keep doing that because I think as you just observe, people with red on their own, they can sometimes show improvement. Right. And I think we have a lot of specialists on the phone, both professionals and families, who are really asking this in the direction of communication, the use of eye gaze devices, communication therapy, um, and would you put that in the category of intensive yeah, that's, therapies? You know, I, I cannot imagine 30 years ago when we saw girls with that, we really never imagined that we can have them come communicates through these devices, but with training, some of the girls really are very good at making their likes and dislikes know and what they want. And they even sometimes crack jokes how they pick on their parents by picking certain pictures. So I think it's really important and this speaks to that as well. Um, I'm going to let you know um, and let the audience know that unfortunately the recording uh, had a glitch. So the recording has stopped at this point for our presentation, but for everybody who is attending live, we can continue. We have a few more minutes for questions. But Dr. Zogby, what I might need to do is take some of these questions and we'll prepare them into a QA document to share with others because the recording did, did stop. Um, we're limited by technology sometimes. Okay, um, a question from one of our audience attendees is, do you believe that there's one curative treatment that will help all individuals with Rett syndrome, or do you think there'll be a variety, a cocktail of treatments that will be helpful? And will individuals need different, several different types of curative treatments? Will gene therapy be a cure-all, or do you, do you see deep brain stimulation, uh, compound, uh, drug compound, yeah. gene therapy, intensive therapy, all having to be working together? Um, I think that at minimum, at minimum, I see whatever the most effective therapy. Let's say if gene therapy proves to be a great way to replace this protein, I see the need of intensive physical and occupational and behavioral therapy and retraining to go along with it. It's not gonna do it all on its own. It might help the seizures all on its own. It's the same for the antisense oligos for the duplication. I can see those perhaps helping the seizures, improving maybe attention, uh, cutting down perhaps on infections, but I don't see you know, to gain the motor flexibility, to gain ability to walk if one is not walking, to learn to communicate better perhaps with words, all of that would require that intensive therapy. So this is in the best case scenario, if we have one therapy, uh, an ASO type of therapy for duplication, a gene therapy type safely for both of them done safely for, for RET. Uh, on the other hand, it may take more than that if we discover that that's not sufficient because maybe some things are amenable to therapeutic at a certain age, others less, then that's where we jump starting the network with something like DPS is something we need to be thinking about. It's, it's too early and we don't know yet, you know, how any particular intervention is going to work. So we have to first give an intervention a chance. And when we see what positive output came from that intervention, we can then add to it behavioral and physical intensive therapies to see in combination what it can accomplish and then decide if that's not enough or enough. I think right. if we're waiting for any therapies, the best tool we have right now is to keep these girls active, engage, and train them as much as we can. I, I agree. And uh, certainly cannot harm, and you have data showing that it will definitely help. 
and at RettSyndrome.org, we're very much invested in um, supporting researchers who are interested in finding the right types of therapies uh, that will work for specific Rett syndrome symptoms. Okay, I'm gonna make attempt to read this next question. Um, uh, the, Thanks so much for showing the importance on early intensive training. I wonder in testing mice, if a Rett mouse will not go to perform, is that remembering where it is or is it a motor planning issue that causes the mouse to not go where they may want to go? So if you train it and it improves, have you then trained memory or motor planning? Right. Excellent question. Somebody's really paying attention. I appreciate that. Um, we actually do this memory. So this is, if you can call when we did the memory training, we did it between one month and three months. The reason is because after three months, they do have motor planning issues. Before three months, they don't. So we really did it to focus on the learning and memory. So this was actually a learning and memory. It wasn't, an, in, a, in fact, they swim more because they're sitting there and planning and searching. They just they just couldn't remember that, you know, it's in that southeast corner or whatever corner it's in. Okay, scrolling, scrolling through the questions. Um, we have quite a few, and I think I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take some of these offline with you to develop a QA document. We have a lot of people thanking you for your work. We have a lot of questions on trofinitide. Um, I know that that is um, not work from your lab. That's work being done by Neuron and Acadia. Um, you've seen some of the questions. Is there any comments that you'd like to make on trofinitide or would you like me to take a stab at the questions? I mean, I, since I'm really not involved in, in this study, it's hard for me to answer very specific questions. Um, this is a, a trial for one of those pathways that are downstream of MACP2, something that can help boost the activity and, and maybe robustness of neurons. So I think that this trial, I, if I understand correctly, will be starting the end of uh, this year. That's correct? Mm -hmm. right. That's the plan. Right, that's the plan. So really that's all I know at this point. Um, but this is, so this trial falls in the realm of something that could be positively uh, influencing neuronal function and activity uh, based on what's known about this molecule and based on what we know about Tourette syndrome, but it's not really a treatment that would replace a missing gene or modify, you know, um, the the function of neurons completely because it's just one of many things that are altered. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to allow one more question here, and this goes back to genetics, and um, I think you might be able to answer this. If there's a parent who would like to find out how much of the brain has the faulty MECP2 for their child, is there a way to test for this? Not really. Uh, we can't tell what's in the brain. We can look in the blood, but and often the blood reflects what's in the brain early on in children. Mm -hmm. Later in life, also it doesn't reflect. But early on, it's or maybe in skin fibroblast, one could get an idea of what's in the brain. But you can never be hundred percent sure. So you may find you have 50/50 in the blood or the skin fibroblast. And that may mirror what's in the brain, or it may be 50-50 in the blood or fibroblast, and it may be 60-40 in the brain. So it's really hard. I, I think that in general, what we find that people who have a very mild form, they tend to have more of the healthy gene expressed in the blood, and we presume that's what's happening in the brain. Okay. So would it be worthwhile to do a blood test? Um, 
Is it really going to tell you anything, change your strategy? Um, I don't think it will change the strategy. I really think that um, the, the most important thing is, is to engage these uh, children and adults and do as much work with them as possible, irrespective of what the blood test shows, really. This is, once you know there is Rett syndrome and there's a, there is the clinical picture of Rett syndrome and in the individual, that together with a mutation, you know the answer. You know, exactly how much in the brain there is is not gonna help us change anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think that's important. Um, we all wanna know as much as we can about our children and we wish we could have a window into it, but uh, we also want to be realistic about what the results might tell us. So I appreciate your honesty. Okay, I think we're getting near the end of the time and it does worry me that we don't have uh, the ability to continue recording your answers. So let's, let's, let's take some time to, to do a QA document because there are some good questions here. And I um, really wanna take a few minutes. I'm going to take control back of the screen. If you don't mind, Dr. Zawi, but please go ahead and keep your webcam on. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I thank the families for staying with us the whole time and asking excellent questions. And we'll be happy to answer them. And uh, hopefully the most important thing I can do really is keep pushing the research. Thank you again. You are pushing the research and you are pushing it in many directions. And uh, I appreciate that greatly because I don't think that there will be uh, one perfect solution that will come and we don't have a crystal ball to know the timeline. So um, I thank you. I thank your postdocs. I thank your graduate students. Uh, we realize it takes a very big team working around the clock to nurture these mice, to give them the conditions that will reflect um, hopefully results that will translate to humans. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Zabi. Thank you. Um, to our attendees, uh, families, clinicians, and professionals, we hope you found value in today's session and that the knowledge you learned will empower you in ways great and small in your path forward, especially in the area of continuing to believe that all efforts that you put into your children to have a good quality of life for your family to fight for services, for therapies, for education, for communication is worthwhile. We as a foundation commit to continuing to invest in good science, to bring um, education to you, information to you so that you can stay empowered along the way. We really appreciate our sponsors who allow us to do educational programming so that the donations into our foundation can be directly um, invested in research. Sorry, changing some things around on my screen here. Okay, I'd like to um, let you know every month we do Red Ed webcasts, and uh, this one was very scientific. Next month, we have another scientific presentation, but on a different topic. Um, Dr. Jillian Townen and Dr. Teresa Bartolotta, two of multiple um, researchers who were funded to do some scientific investigation into communication guidelines and best practices from around the world. Uh, have been working on this project for a few years and are going to join us next month on Tuesday, October 8th, to share some information about these communication guidelines. So, tying back to Dr. Zogby's information that intensive therapies are important to our um, own belief and knowledge of our kids that communication is possible, let's talk about the how-tos and um, get some evidence. Uh, to support the advocacy work that you're doing to access um, communication devices and get some strategies that will be supported by the professionals working in your child's life. So join us next month for that next ed. We also know the value of being together in person, both as families. Um, many of us don't have somebody in our neighborhood 
with Rett syndrome, and uh, we also benefit from being together with our experts. So we appreciate those who have enjoyed the education days that we've hosted in 2019 across the country. We have two more coming up. Um, uh, at Monmouth University in New Jersey, October 24, 25, which reminds me that October is Rett Syndrome Awareness Month. I hope you all have plans to raise awareness in your community. Many of our families, uh, members and friends really wanna help our children. They wanna help us. They're just waiting for us to ask uh, what they can do. So October is a great time for you to wear your team colors, uh, take advantage of some of the awareness campaigns and ask those in your community to join in to raise awareness of Rett syndrome in, um, in around the world. November 2nd, they'll be in Ed Day at the University of Rochester Medical Center. If you go to our website, rettsyndrome.org, you can um, see links to the registration for these Ed Days and as well registration for the webcasts. So in closing thoughts, I just want to say um, thank you for attending. Thank you for being active in the community. Thank you for fundraising. Your dollars are being spent very wisely, invested in um, to people who really care about our children and the results are showing. We also encourage you to consider participating in research. It's never been more important for you as a family to talk uh, with each other and make the decision if you are ready to commit to participating in research, whether it's a clinical trial, the natural history study, answering a survey or questionnaire, making the decision to do brain donation if that time comes. Every single effort is as important as fundraising is as important as raising awareness in your community. And we appreciate you considering staying aware of those opportunities. And if you have any questions as to how to engage, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so for now, that concludes our webcast for today. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Zogby. Good luck with your meeting next month. I'm very excited. Congratulations on the 20 year anniversary. I don't know where we would be today without you and Ruthie Amir and all of the um, things that came together 20 years ago that allowed you to be where you are today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. <laughs>